Every day, ordinary people make extraordinary choices as they negotiate unpredictable pathways to the peak of their expectations without ever taking the time to enjoy the view. Join me, Tish Tyndall, at this panoramic viewpoint of astonishing personal and professional progress as we find out why my next guest is living the fabulous life. Carrie Cates, welcome. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're most welcome. And where, where are you today? I'm in Austin, Texas, in my guest bedroom that has become an office due to the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that looks like a really cool office. So, Carrie, I've been reading about you um, and looking at some of your work online. And it really seems to me that education has played a massive part in your life. Is it something that has played as big a part as filmmaking? Yeah, so, you know, it's funny because I feel like, um, and I'm sure a lot of edu other educators might, you know, think this, but maybe wouldn't share it, is that it is a little self-serving um, being a teacher and sharing, you know, my passion. First off, it's great because it pays my mortgage and pays my bills. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas filmmaking can be a little hit and miss, but uh, it's also good in that I'm, uh, you know, just saying the same things over and over and over in classroom settings. And sometimes it does take several hits on the, the basics of filmmaking to really actually fully consume it and really, um, you know, make it part of your own routine. Um, and then, of course, I've seen a lot of really great filmmakers uh, that I look up to who have spent a good amount of time mentoring others. And uh, what that's kind of created for them is their own little community, these, this group of people who uh, anything that that filmmaker puts out, these people are their active cheerleaders, their representatives, they're like brand ambassadors sort of that will uh, you know, go to the ends of the earth to try to support them back. And uh, I really want that. I want um, to have this like group of creatives around me at all times that uh, we're all lifting each other up um, and uh, doing our best there. So, and where I, did you where did you get that sort of exuberance for for teaching and creating? Because I I read that you studied in America and New Zealand. Where did where does this this enthusiasm come from? Oh man, um, I don't know. It's interesting because I my. Uh, my whole family are engineers, like computer technology engineers and mm -hmm. whatnot. Um, their brains are very much in that space. And I'm really the only, I'm like oddball creative that was always at like Thanksgiving dinner, telling stories and keeping everyone entertained. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, I always got a lot back from that. I'd always felt like that was my place in the, the family. That was always my place pretty much anywhere I went. I was, I'm the storyteller. I'm the one who's going to be uh, either making up something to keep us entertained or just like, you know, being the entertainer myself. Um, and I started actually in theater. Um, whenever I went to college initially, I thought that's what I was going to do. Um, and funny enough, it seems like uh, I did the same thing that a lot of others are doing in that, um, hmm, I'm trying to think of how to put this, uh, essentially with theater it's just this one-time show and then it's over and there's like yes. this you know you don't have anything tangible it's after. gone yes exactly and that always felt to me very anticlimactic I just was like oh I've got this high this energy and I want to push my end product more but it, it, it's over it's gone <laughs> so yeah. it gave me that way to share and then also of course I'm very inclined toward technology so uh, what struck me about you um, was the the amount of things that you're doing. So you're writing, you're producing, you're filming, you're 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 you know judging film festivals. You're on panels. I saw you on something the other day uh, for the horror festival. You're teaching. You're the community director for the uh, the film school. Is that right in Austin? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And and yet you also had another teaching career which was slightly different. Um, what was it that you did um, that took you to the, the, the film teaching? You know, what, what part of your teaching career got you there? 
Yeah, so it actually, I wasn't teaching before. I was actually in technology. Um, when I graduated college, it was 2008. And um, I'm sure many of Americans can remember how the economy was doing then. Um, yeah. A lot of people had gotten laid off. So essentially, I was enter entering like an industry, a film industry that uh, I was competing for jobs against people who had almost been able to retire from the past job. Yeah let go from so it was really competitive and um so I was just kind of trying to find my way find a space that I could work and you know do a pretty good job I I, I always value being good at my job no matter what yeah. the job is um yeah. and so I was working like a geek squad at Best Buy like fixing people's hard drives um uh -huh. I was doing a technologist at a, an L or sorry at a elementary and middle school um, for dyslexic students. That's and, what I read. That's yeah. the bit I read, yeah. Yeah, and it was it was great. Um, I think that that, I mean, it serves you really well. As a filmmaker, you should have lots of jobs. You of should course. be used to a lot of these things because my time at Best Buy made me really good at building schedules for film sets because essentially I was building schedules for an entire store location. So I had 50 people running around and they all needed work schedules every single week that I was programming in. That made me especially good at dealing with these crazy schedules that you get in the independent world where you might have some crew members that have part-time jobs that they can't let go yeah. of. Um, so that worked out really nicely. And the technology side of it or the technologist side of it um, made me really good at things like um, if a hard drive or an SD card fails, I'm usually actually able to recover a lot of that footage, um, mm. which can really, I think it can really give you like a breather when you know, like, okay, it's not all gone. Like we might no. be able to salvage some of this. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's all kind of brought you to where you are today. Do mm -hmm. you think that that's really important for somebody starting out in the industry? You know, you have to take all of your experiences and take them with you. Have you always valued everything that you've done? You you talk about being a hard worker. Is that something you, you've always felt you should have a strong work ethic and place value on the task? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. Um, and I mean, I've had a jobs just like everybody else, like things like um, serving pizza. Like I worked at yeah. different pizza places in college. And while that it might be a bit of a stretch to even say that I brought anything from that job onto set. I mean, there've been times where I'm like, Hey, I know a quick way I can feed a lot of people for not very much money. And it's not that I'm yeah. serving on my set. It's that I have some culinary background skills of things of that we discovered in the kitchen while I was working there. So um, yeah, I think that there's little aspects and everybody should always think of every single opportunity that they've ever had as something that can feed into filmmaking because filmmaking is so multifaceted. There's a place yeah. for a cook on a set. There's a place for somebody who knows how to mow lawns on a set. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> it really is a creative industry, isn't it? And 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 that's what we have to remember and, 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 and keep creating. I watched you uh, last week um, on some uh, Q&A sessions on the horror festival, um, and I was absolutely blown away at how you responded to people. Aww, that's great. How you gave, you yeah, know, it's true. I, and that's why I said to Elizabeth, well, I, I need to get Carrie on the show. I'll tell you what it was, Carrie. It was the way that you responded to people about their storytelling. You know, especially when you were, you know, commending them for, for thinking the way a certain individual would think. You know, you telling them that they can't write something for somebody and just stick it on them. You know, right. where where do you feel feel that that sort of kindness plays a part in the industry? You know, I know I know you're just telling them as it is, but you could also probably say it to them in 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 not such a very nice way. And and you were so positive and patient. How important do you think that is? I think that's super important. Um and. Gosh, like literally everything you're saying, I'm just like, I'm blushing. I'm trying to oh, it. It's true. It's um, absolutely true. But yeah, I think, I mean, I do, I always really, really appreciate all art that is created. I think that there's some value in everything, even if it's just that catharsis of the filmmaker getting something out that they needed to get out. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, I think that it really doesn't serve anyone to be one of those people who is better than everyone else or is going to put other people down so that they can try to lift themselves up. That's just, it really doesn't work, I don't think, in the film industry. It, I think that we should all be helping each other out. It does yes. certainly help that I've managed to like kind of create a job for myself um, as the community director over at Austin School of Film, where I work with, um, well, right now I have 37 active fiscally sponsored projects that I'm working with to help get funding wow. or have donors or working through grants. And they're all at different stages. And I, I love that. I love knowing that part of, I think the word you used earlier was legacy. Part of my legacy, yeah. I want to be that I helped as many filmmakers as possible. And even if some of those filmmakers was just like a pat on the back that they did really well, and maybe that's something that they needed to hear in that moment. And why can't we all just be nice to each other? It's so and you, and you, you know, this is such a, a, a major thing I, I feel in the industry is that kindness is so important. You know, you might meet somebody today that you'll need to know tomorrow or vice versa. But not everybody has the facility within themselves to be as kind and to be as helpful. Were there people that you had in your life that were that to you, Carrie? Yeah, you know, I would I would actually almost disagree with what you're saying there. I think that everyone could be yeah. kind. I think that it's a lot of work. I mean, there are <laughs> definitely days where to put on a smile and to have like gone above and beyond for somebody was so exhausting that I immediately come home and fall asleep. Um, Absolutely. But yeah, I mean, there have been a lot of people that I've interacted with in the industry that have left uh, some sort of impact on me, whether it be good or bad, just from the small interactions I've had with them. There have been amazing filmmakers that, um, like I said before, I've seen like Kat Candler, for instance, did this. Um, she's done like so much mentorship um, she's an Austin-based filmmaker. She worked on 13 Reasons Why. She's one of the oh. showrunners of Queen Sugar. Um, she had a film called Hellion that uh, had Aaron Paul in it not long ago. And I can't sing enough of her praises. She is one of those people who, while I never got direct mentorship from her, I've always looked to her for guidance or looked to see what it is that she's doing next because I'm like, that's the next kind of move I want to make. Yeah. And um I love that she's been so open about things. I love that her honesty is really refreshing and the time that she spends with her students um, because she's always been a teacher. She taught at UT. She taught at Austin School of Film, actually. One of the classes that I teach now, she had taught about 10 or 11 years ago. Wow. Um, and so there's like, there's people like that. There's um, Jeff Nichols, for example. They're not all, not all my mentors are women. Um, but a lot of them are, but uh, like mm -hmm. Jeff Nichols is a Academy um, nominated um, film director who made, just look him up. He's made a lot of yeah. stuff really, yeah. really extensive. Um, and we, for the Austin Youth Film Festival, which is a, a nonprofit that I started about nine years ago um, mm -hmm. that essentially supports young filmmakers, uh, mostly high school students. Yeah. Um, We'd asked him, hey, would you know, we know you live in Austin. Is there any way we could bother you and you come and talk to these kids at our festival? And not only did he come and talk to the kids, he loved it so much, loved like that energy that the kids were giving back and spent so much time even just like standing in the hallway after the, the theater was letting out just to like shake kids' hands and like take pictures with them. That's the kind of filmmaker I want to be. I want to be that person who... I don't value my, like, I mean, I value my time, but that to me is such a valuable use of your time um, to really be, like you said, kind, I guess. There's no yeah. other great word for it. And those kids are going to remember that. I remember it. Um, yes. And so now anything that I see that has his name on it anywhere, I'm going to go see and I'm going to support and I'm going to post about it and yeah. I'm going to share because I think that's, that's like, again, it's a really, really great use of his time to have spent that with those kids. This industry, it looks easy from the outside, but it's not. There's so yeah. many things that you can have go wrong. There's so much that can just like not play out the way you hoped. Um, and there's so much of the perseverance that you have to have to be good at it 
to be able to hear from 20 different film festivals that your first film didn't make it in and still go yeah. on and make your next film. Yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah, I think that that's really like one of the most valuable things because I didn't even hear that in college. I just yeah. heard you just make films and you'd submit them and you know what, they get in. And it's like, that's just not how this works. And, and so where did you develop that resilience? Where did that come from for you? Oh my gosh. I've always been somebody that won't let anybody really tell me no. Um, and I, I, I think that that, you know, it comes from my upbringing in that I grew up on a farm in Indiana and somehow yeah. I became a filmmaker. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't, yeah, I don't know. I think that there's that, there's definitely some level of like insane feminist, I guess, uh, in me as well, that when I see a space that's full of men, I just put myself in the middle of that room. Um, and that's essentially how I spent four years at Indiana State as an RTF major was in a room full of men. Now okay. I spend that time on sets that are rooms full of men. And finally, now I'm in that position as a producer where I get to make sure that room isn't full of men. Um, and it's a pretty fair shake about who it is that we are hiring and what's going on in that background. So. And and yeah. with that power comes great responsibility. It does. And, you know, and it is, do you find that easy to bear or has it been a, a shift for you to, to, to take that on board? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I actually haven't seen it as much of an obstacle, which is surprising. I know. <laughs> I mean, there's yeah. definitely, um, there are obstacles, but I think the power isn't necessarily one of them. I do feel a lot of times responsible when, like a crew member the night before a shoot decides like they're not going to be able to make it because they got a higher yeah. paying gig or, yeah. um, or they're sick or, you know, things that are out of my control. Um, but I've always been pretty good at like really compartmentalizing, like what's under my control. Okay. That person leaving is not, but what is under my control is now contacting every single sound person that I know to replace them. Um, and I get so much energy from overcoming those like last minute obstacles that, um I don't know I, I've had that happen before obviously as okay. an example and I wasn't able to sleep after I found that sound person because I was just so amped that I was going to show up with a better sound person than I had yes so has there ever been a time when you thought I can't do this I this is too hard um I can't, you know these responsibilities are too difficult or or have you always been just this this power pack you know this producer of 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 um of great enthusiasm that can overcome things yeah so something i share with my students uh every single time that they're about to go into production is that i cry the night before shoot almost every time it doesn't matter how under control i feel like it is um, I think maybe it's something similar to what we were talking about before this episode started, which is when things feel like they're going too smoothly, I oh, start yeah. getting a little worried. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think that's just part of it, just that sometimes it's a release of, oh, okay, like tomorrow's a big day. I hope it goes as planned. Um, I tend to be an over planner too. So like when things get derailed, um, that kind of, I don't know, it throws me off. Um, but I guess, I don't know. Those, I guess, all those jobs that you had then got you planning, you know? Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> you should see the spreadsheets. <laughs> I, I, I think I can imagine. I can imagine. And, you know, for anybody watching this who wants to go into the industry, who maybe is thinking, is it the right thing for me to do? What would be the one thing? you would say to them? One thing that I think that would be worthwhile for somebody who's entering or thinking about entering this industry to know is that um, this industry runs in a very different way than any other in that you can't just go onto Monster or onto Indeed or something like that mm -hmm. and find a production job, most likely. Like that's not how you're gonna get your start. You have to like create your own opportunities. And for me, moving to Austin was that opportunity. That was my first move. And then I basically decided I am a producer now. I'm going to find a script that I want to make. And then I'm going to go to the ends of the earth to pull the people, places, things, money, whatever it needs to make it happen. And within a year of me moving to Austin, I had made my first feature film. So I 
think that's something that people have to know starting out is that no one's going to hand you an opportunity. There's not going to be one that just like magically shows up on one of these websites. You have to do that. And then once you've done it the hardest way possible, people are going to start taking notice and they are going to start handing you more and more opportunities as you go. And I mean, I'm still, I still feel like even though I've been doing this for 10 years, I'm still just getting started. I still yes. don't get handed enough like opportunities to just go and do the thing. Um, and I, I it gets easier each time. So <laughs> do you know what I would say to somebody who was starting out in this industry? I would say get in touch with Carrie Kate. <laughs> So nice. <laughs> because she's going to talk you through this in a way that's going to make you want to do it. And, and uh, you know, I'm so, I'm so glad that we've had the opportunity to speak, Carrie, because, as I said before, when I watched you with those, um, those filmmakers in the question and answer session, I, I was blown away at your generosity, you know, at your, your, your gift of creativity. You are somebody who doesn't hold on to all the talents that you have. You are somebody who is sharing that. And, and for young people and for anybody going into the industry, that is the most important thing. Like you say, that people are not selfish with their knowledge, that, that they don't feel that they have to hold back in case that student is going to be better than they are. Right. And I mean, you, you're an inspiration, Carrie. I, you know, I, I really hope that at another time we may have more time to chat because um, you are a leading lady, not only um, behind the camera, but in the education industry, I would say too, as well as the creative one. And um, Carrie, I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time. I know how busy you are. And, and, and this has just been truly fabulous. And so from me here in Scotland to you here in Austin, Carrie Kate, thank you so much. Aww. You are living a fabulous life. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciated it. All, like a lot of the time we stop our ourselves it's not us hearing a no or other people we maybe blame it on other people of why we don't do certain things but it's actually our inner voice and not letting our inner child take over and make it all happen i get home from school on i do external pe since i do more than 15 hours of dance a week and so um i on b days i get off at 303 and then on 303 you know, and I, I sincerely believe that we never stop progressing in our lives, you know, we never stop progressing and we should never think that we've ever reached that peak point because there's always something else to learn. Always you've got the support of your family and your, your loved ones. Um, but belief, belief, I, I, I think for me, I, I love what I do. So Ali al Kafaji, how are you? I'm great. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Do you know, Ali, I've been practicing saying your name. Ruth Connell, I cannot believe that you are joining us on The Fabulous Life. I'm so honoured to be talking to you, darling. How are you? I'm good. It's so nice to hear your, your Scottish accent. Uh, and you've got one as well. You've still I've, got one. I've hung on to it. For, I've clung on to it for dear life. Quite right. <laughs> And it actually right, serves right. me, it serves me um, well out here, maybe better than I did at home. <laughs> Does it? Is, it? is it a really good thing to have? Yeah, I'm really lucky. Um, it's people have a fondness, um, I think, for Scottish and Irish. Um, maybe you know, Australian, it's something different. Americans, I find, have been so welcoming. And I do think that accent's part of it, so... And of course, the Celtic look, because you really do have a Celtic look. That must be a bonus. I do. And I never really realised, you know, when I was in Scotland, I never realised how Scottish I was. I no. just think I was like this kind of child of the universe. And then you go 5,000 miles away from Scotland and you realise how um, your, uh, you know, things like your point of view, your perspective, and your work ethic, everything like that, mm. how, just how Scottish you are. So where are you now, darling? Are you, are you in Los Angeles? I'm in Los Angeles. <laughs> and uh, the sun is shining it's the day before thanksgiving and it's quite hectic i have to say so i'm glad we could fit this in 
And you're cooking for Thanksgiving. Are you doing any of the cooking? Right. So I'm not, I, you know, I can do it, but it's not what I spend a lot of my time and energy on. So I've elected to do the hors d'oeuvres, I think you say. Oh, wow. So yeah, I've got two, I've got two recipes up my sleeve wow. um, that you can kind of prepare before and then you just sort of put in the oven. So I'm, I'm, that, that's my, that's the extent of my responsibility. And that lets you relax and enjoy it then? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also setting the table. I'm, I've, um, I, I quite like doing that. I've got these fancy placemats and candle holders and Thanksgiving um, little things you stick on the glasses. And I, I, I realise the things, you know, to, so everyone keeps their own glass. Okay, yeah, oh yeah. And that's so important. It, it's important, especially right now, right? But mm-hmm. I realised... I bought them on um, online and I never really looked very closely. And so there's like an acorn and a leaf and nice Thanksgiving things. And then there's like um, an American Indian lady and an American Indian man and then a, pil- a pilgrim lady and a pilgrim man. And it's actually probably not politically correct. It's maybe going to be complicated anymore. So those might not make it. Those, those <laughs> things as well. Because apparently it's based on, a, you know, there's a, obviously we're finding out so much this year about um, mm. some conditions and inherent uh, problems that there are. And so we're on a big learning curve and this particular decoration company needs to catch up. So they maybe <laughs> they heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and tell me, you know, you're, you are such an inspiration to, to us all, not just to Scottish people, to, to people all over the world. You, you are a Hollywood superstar. You're an, an enormous oh. success. Oh. You know, I, I uh, mean, are you liking I'm, this? Is this I, good? I, yeah, thanks so much. Um, <laughs> but one of the things I thought was nice about your podcast, from the fabulous, um, the, using the word fabulous, is that that's something... I brought in to the show, like I brought in that word, that was a kind of Rowena word. So um, just a bit to mention that to you, but you know, I'm very, you know, supernatural has been an amazing thing in my life. Um, it, it's so, it is still, um, you know, people either know it and love it or, you know, they've no idea about it. So to say that I'm yeah. a Hollywood star, you know, I'm not, not quite there yet, but I'm ever so grateful for the success that I have had. It's 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 been incredible and with the fans and the fandom and the conventions and everything mm-hmm. you do sometimes feel like you are yeah. <laughs> a bit of a superstar yeah. and then yeah yeah you 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 bring your scottish um, feet in the ground um, you, know, you put your scottish feet back in the ground and you realize you know because that's a great leveler isn't it your scottish feet it's the way that you think it is just you know what do they mean me you know I, I, have you felt that way since you've gone over there it's yeah it's um yeah and it's, there's so many levelers in our business all the time I have to say like you know things will always bring you back down to earth you know I really even though I was on this show and I couldn't be happier and more excited about it I still couldn't get um, an agent or a manager of any recognizable level what uh, Mm-hmm. still because they're like well you know it's a sci-fi show it's kind of over here you're this old you're a woman uh, you know and things are changing uh, things are still changing but it still wasn't like a given it wasn't like oh you know you've you've done this many episodes of the show here you go it doesn't it, it never comes that easily in our business and I remember um, hearing Lake Bell if you know who she is she was at my college yep. and not that she told me this directly but I remember hearing early on she had success quite early on and and I remember hearing from her that you know that you still had to, the ladder just kept going down and you still have to, you know, you still have to kind of do this yeah. and realizing that this career that I'm in is not like, but for very few people is that you do this one part and you ping, you know, it's a very mm. much, the ladder sort of along the ground <laughs> that you just have yeah. to kind of keep going, yeah. going along and there's not one big quick fix and there's a, a level of sustainability that you have to find. But you, you are so multifaceted. I mean, you are triple threat. You are everything more than triple threat. That's one thing since I've been researching you. You know, you can do everything, Ruth. Now, come on. I've I seen really it. Can't. I've seen I'm it being, on YouTube. I'm not being falsely modest here. I really can't. I used to be able to dance. I did. I was a good dancer. But it was quite a bit of dancing, wasn't it? There was, there was a fair bit. But um, the singing thing, What online, there's lots of photographs where I look like I'm a really good singer. <laughs> <laughs> because we've, we've got such amazing phot- photographers in the fandom and Fish Milky got these amazing shots of me and the truth is um, 
my mum has perfect pitch and my dad is tone deaf and I'm somewhere <laughs> in the middle so sometimes I sound all right and, and but not always and it's I get that's been a, a great leveler for me and you know, keeping you know, keeping my ego in check you know I go and sing live and I do it because the fans are so supportive and responsive yeah but I, I do sing I do sing off tune sometimes and it's still nobody dies and everyone's okay everybody cheers <laughs> they cheer. from what I've seen everybody's cheering so keep doing what you're doing it's keep fabulous trying. God yeah. fire. <laughs> Keep doing it. And tell me, you know, because you have studied all of the aspects of the performing arts, it seems to me, did you think it was going to be acting that you would find your success through? I really, you know, it was always acting that I wanted to do. I just was a dancer. I was sent to dancing lessons to keep my cousin Ruby company when I was five years yeah. old. And I just had an aptitude for it. And I loved it. And I found, but it was always the expressive part of dance that I loved the most, rather right? more yeah. than the technical or, you know, I didn't necessarily have the body that would do all the, the most, um, you know, you see these ballerinas that are yeah. all legs yeah. and everything. And um, so it, it was very much the expressive part of it that I was drawn to. And I just was too embarrassed to say, I want to be an actress because it sounded yeah. like I was saying, I want to be a Hollywood star. And that's really bizarre for a, a girl from a farm in Scotland who, who doesn't look like a model or, you know, I was never anything like that. So it was more, I started, um, I saw plays at the Traverse, mm. these two-hander plays, plays at the Lyceum, the Citizens Theatre, all the theatres in Scotland. And I, I thought, you know, I, I, I could be an actor. I could be one of these people on one of these stages mm -hmm. doing this. And yeah. I could be a character on television, maybe not the the beautiful lead, but I could maybe be this interesting, you know, and sort of, I've had to build my confidence um, as I went with what I think is possible. And now I think anything's possible, but it yeah. was always really acting that I really wanted to do. Um, and I adore dancing, but yeah, it was always that that I had in my heart. Really. And did you develop a resilience early on, do you think, Ruth? Do you think that comes from, you know, being Scottish or is that something that you found when you crossed the pond and, and ended up in Los Angeles? Yeah, it's, I am quite determined. Yeah. Um, and I, I think lo like loving what you do helps um, getting some positive uh, feedback helps, you know, good teachers. Uh, lots of support from fellow actors and dancers and you know like there's lots of things help you along the way um your family friends i yeah i sort of a sort of bizarre kind of um belief somewhere i mean I've, and i struggle with confidence and anxiety and all those things for sure but just a real desire to to just want to be a part of it. I, I, I love, I could tell you so many things about so many actors or biographies and everything. I sort of, the love for it or, or the love for the craft and everything craft, just yeah. sort of pulls you through. And yeah, I'm so, I sort of, I had a real uh, tricky year. 2013 was a real tricky year in my life. And I remember filling in questionnaires online, what should I do with my life? Because I wasn't, you know, I was, good at school and I could have maybe yep. done different things and and I realized maybe I might want to be a writer or maybe I might want to do this you know whatever the other things were that I might want to do and I realized that at that point even though I wasn't having the success I wanted that really it was what I loved the most and that there was honor and valor and trying no matter what even if I wasn't having the success I wanted that I would rather die trying yes absolutely. <laughs> I, I couldn't see myself giving up and I was having to do all these other jobs to support myself all the time. But that, so I sort of, I find my humility a little bit when I sort of gave in a little bit to like, well, I'm just going to have to keep doing what it takes to try to move forward with yeah. what I love. That's actually when the, the breakthroughs came, when I sort of gave in to that. Um, and it was, it came from a lot of, a really terrible year and a lot of grief and pain and really questioning everything. But when I got right down to the grass tax of it all, brass tax of it all, it was still what I loved and what what I was most excited about. So and it's it's interesting to hear you say and talk about anxiety and and you know um, perhaps a, a lack of self-confidence. Um 
we have a performing arts college up here in, in, in Lossiemouth. And when I was asking the students, you know, do you have any questions for Ruth? And, and, and you know, they're just a little uh, in awe of you. But the, what they really wanted to know was, did you overcome anything by getting the, the larger roles? You know, did you feel a little more confident? Did the, did the anxiety yeah. go away a little? I've, I, I really... And maybe it is a Scottish thing, I don't know. I've, all, I've always got to prove things to myself. My mum never wanted me um, to be spoiled or arrogant. Um, and I realised when I was doing all these questionnaires about what should I do with my life, I realised that the things I'd been most successful at were the things that I had put the most into, that I'd worked the hardest at. And you can really give yourself confidence by have for me, this is just me, by having done the work you know I've done my preparation I know my lines I've really put my heart and soul and my imagination and this is my take on this audition for example and this is what I've got to offer and then it's out of your hands and you can you can really give yourself uh, it's a craft it's a skill yeah. Larry Moss talks about it you know you love what you do and do your best to be the the best possible you at doing what you yep. do and and it's amazing how things roll out from there. But yeah, I've had to build my confidence incrementally and it can get knocked. You know, you just yeah. you do a bad take, there's a funny atmosphere on set and you start to think, oh my God, I, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Yeah. Uh, Meryl Streep talks about it when she was doing Dancing at Lunasa, the movie. Yes. Yeah, and she, she started to lose confidence because of the dialect coach was being very pernickety with her. And so it, we're all susceptible to it. But if you do take a break, you know, that thing about take a rest, don't give up. Yeah. Take a break you know, do something just to build a little bit of confidence, even if it's just something, sometimes I do just really simple things in the house and I'm like, oh, I get a sense of satisfaction and I'm not trying to climb the mountain that day. You know, I plant a plant I want to plant or do something I feel a bit better about myself and then I'm yeah. ready, more able to tackle bigger things. Um, some people are born, some people are born like, oh, you know, no bother. <laughs> they just go um, for it. But that's not me. Do, do you think then that, you mentioned 2013. Do you think you found a way to get through a period like that? You know, when you could have given up, I suppose, but you chose not to. Did you yeah. find a way? I had to trudge, trudge through the mud quite a lot and I was really lucky. Um, I was really lucky with, I got some support. And this is what I would say. This is just my, my, my experience and I think maybe we're more open to it in Scotland now than before obviously yeah. I'm in La La Land and everyone's like a therapist and and all of that but you know we go to a, a, t a dance teacher to get better at dancing we go to a sports therapist if we have an injury why are why are mental health services and just how to live meditations all that kind of stuff, all that stuff that we can do to support our heart and our mind and our spirit and everything why is that not part of a curriculum or why is that why is there any shame about getting some counseling or getting some professional help around things and i i, I spend money on it mm -hmm. um i'll do a therapy session or a healing session or something faster than i'll buy a dress or something else because if I feel good in myself and I feel prepared and I've got some tools and skill sets then I can do better and earn more money and buy a, a more expensive dress actually yeah. <laughs> and, so, and I think that 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 will be so inspiring for people watching or listening to this because you look so confident Ruth I mean you do <laughs> and, and whether or not you feel it when you're singing and you know you look like you are and that's a really lovely thing to say about you know to look after yourself before you think about anything else because like you say you know people are, are having to do that right now Ruth you know and yeah. and we're, we're we're having to live in the here and now because of of COVID-19 we're, we're, we're having to live in the moment and and appreciate what that can give you do you yeah. find that that COVID has had an an effect on your work or on your your the way you think about work yeah I you know, you, one of my, um, it was never a complaint, 
a preoccupation I had was how tired I was flying everywhere all the time to do conventions and whatnot. And there's been a nice aspect of having a rest and realizing, you know, how nice it is to be at home and things be simpler, but then realizing how lucky you are to be able to, to go and, yeah. and do these things. I, the, the implications of what we're all going through and the effects, I don't think we're going to realize them for years to come. I think it's a lot of pressure on people. You're in, in anxious about working in, about money, about all those things. But I, I'd say that my love of what I do and, you know, all we're doing all night, every night, most of us is watching television, yes. watching movies, listening to podcasts, you know, all these cultural things that we've, you know, we maybe don't hold in such high esteem, actually are the our life's buds in, in yeah. so many ways. And so I really think what we do is important. And I, I just want to do even more and get back to it even more. And I've even started kind of thinking about creating my own, my own, you know, my own um, script and, and, and what. Wonderful. So yeah, but it's, it's been such a bizarre, bizarre banana year, hasn't it? It's, oh, it really has. It just, it. It's just taken the wings, the wings from everybody, I think, a little bit. Um, although for creatives and it, it, sort of every creative I've spoken to, they've, like you have um, you know, thought about or are embarking on other projects. What interests me about you, Ruth, is that you, you have this kind of ability to just take everything in your stride, it seems. And from you know, reading <laughs> about you and, and everything that you do, if you were to look back on everything that you've you've done were you ever shocked by the success you know did you ever think really what you know oh. or did you always take it in your stride I know I don't I don't take much in my stride um I was so I'd gone through such a difficult time and I found that that humility I think that I needed to find and that sort of just digging in that I had done so much work I was doing acting workshops I was so ready that I just was like it felt like magic that I had been working for a long time and that finally I had this opportunity and it was just so exciting that there was this chance to shine and thank goodness I'd done enough work on myself and with the right people that I didn't feel um that I shouldn't have a chance or I shouldn't have a turn right why yeah. not me if I'm, I'm trying to be a good person and a good team player and I've got something to offer and, and that there's actually enough light for everybody to have their time and place and chance. Yes. And why not me actually yes. more of what, what it was, um, you know, and I struggle with small things more I, like unbelievably, you know, what did I say in this conversation? You know, like, like everybody, I think, you know, it's yes, of course. all of it. But then if you do, quiet in your mind enough to come back to like how lucky you are to be in, in the position that really helps carry you through a lot of the monkey mind and fear and stuff like that you know if you can remember my tummy's rumbling i was telling you I was eating my raspberries <laughs> <laughs> but we said they weren't scottish raspberries didn't they're we? not so. <laughs> well ruth you know if you were to look back on it all though darling what would you say was fabulous 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 uh it's been so fabulous to play a part that was so fabulous. She's such a fabulous character to have met the fabulous writers I've met, the fabulous actors that I've met, the fabulous fans that I've met. I'm really loving speaking to you, you know, I'm so fabulous to meet you. I'm so grateful for it all. And I really did have some fabulous costumes as well. <laughs> you chat. certainly do. There's been a lot of fabulous and I just, I, I hope it keeps going somehow. Um, I'm open to more fabulousness in the future. You, you certainly are, Ruth, and, and it's been such an amazing thing to talk to you. You know, um, you are exactly as I thought you would be. You know, <laughs> you really are, are you. You're really true. And I think you will be an enormous inspiration to everybody uh, for many years. And uh, you will continue to be an enormous success. So from me, Ruth Connell, here in Lossiemouth to you in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. I just want to say a huge thank you for joining us on The Fabulous Life. It's and, been my uh, and <laughs> thank you and, and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. 
you, oh, well, obviously you too, but you know, have a good Christmas. That's the next one coming up, right? Over there, and which I will it be is. in Scotland. For Christmas. I'm excited. About well, that. enjoy yourself in Scotland, darling, and take care. Okay, lots of love. Thank bye. you, Ruth. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.